Welcome to the third of our DNA Dialogue uh, seminar series. Um, as we start here this morning in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Uh, I'm calling in from the lands of the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation in Bayside, Melbourne. So this DNA Dialogue seminar series uh, is a forum for members of the genomics community in Australia and beyond to learn of new developments in health genomics and the overseas experience and held live via Zoom on the last Thursday of every month. So whack that in your calendar um, because we've had a fantastic uh, series of presentations to date and uh, very excited about um, the session here today. We do want it to be an interactive session, so please ask questions via the Q&A function throughout the presentation and uh, I'll triage and throw them to Stephen and Phil as we get to the end of the talk. So today it's my very great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Phil Wilcox and Stephen Robertson um, who are joining us today from Genome Aotearoa. So Phil, um, there he is. And Stephen's yet to uh, join us by camera, so he'll turn on his camera when he can. Uh, Associate Professor Philip Wilcox has established Maori affiliations and joins us from the University of Otago's Department of Mathematics and Statistics with experience in applied genomics and statistical genetics. For almost 20 years, he's worked in the interface of genetic sciences at Te Ao Maori and co-leads two genomics-based projects focusing on Māori health. He teaches high school, undergraduate and graduate levels and is a member of the Health Research Council of New Zealand's Ethics Committee, which oversees institutional and regional ethics committees. Phil, thank you for joining us. Um, Stephen Robertson uh, has been the Cure Kids Professor of Paediatric Genetics at Otago University in Dunedin, Aotearoa, New Zealand, since 2002. He specialised in paediatrics and subspecialised in clinical genetics after training in Auckland and Melbourne. He held a Nuffield Medical Fellowship at the Institute of Molecular Medicine at Oxford and was studying the genetic basis of uh, genetic disorders characterised by severe life-limiting malformations in children. He is a clinical geneticist and directs the Laboratory of Genomic Medicine at the Dunedin School of Medicine and has an active interest in promoting equitable access to and performance of clinical genomics across Aotearoa, New Zealand. So Stephen, welcome. So the talk today, now I can sort of put my uh, bios to the side. The talk today is addressing uh, an issue that certainly is of great interest uh, in Australia and, and sort of active investment at a, a um, research uh, level um, in that, you know, certainly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island, Islander people um, are underrepresented or not represented in uh, international genomic data sets. And we're very keen to hear about the approaches in Aotearoa to address uh, this matter systemically, as well as the specific issue of enrichment of genomic data sets. So without further ado, I am going to throw to Phil and Stephen, and thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, I might just do a quick uh, greeting um, if I can get my computer to work. Um, and I'll do this, we've got a translation in front of you, but I'll, it's appropriate when I do these um, introductions that we uh, that I use my, in, my, my native tongue. Um, and so here goes. Uh, e korore o ki te atua, e maunga ki te whenua, e whakaaru pai ki ngā tangata katoa. Uh, e ngā mana, Ingaria, 
ko, ko rātou tūpuna hoki, ko rātou irifakatipu. Ko te tuarua, e mihi hoki ki, ngā, ki, ki, o, ki, o, ki o māua uh, whanaunga e noho ana uh, i, i, i ahti te reiria. Uh, tuatoru, e ngā kai, kai putao, kai rangaharu, ko taimai nei kiko nei, mo, hei whakarongo tēnei kaupapa, tēnā koutou. Ano reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā tātou katoa. So, um, We've already had a little bit of an introduction to us. I'll just add my um, Māori tribal affiliations up there and um, included amongst um, those activities of work close, well, I've worked closely with my own tribe. Um, I was a mandated spokesperson uh, at one stage when we had a um, health and ancestry study underway. Um, and most of my research and education activities these days are in, are in what I refer to as Māori space. Um, and included amongst that, um, last year I was fortunate enough to receive um, or be the recipient of the Outstanding Education Award from the Genetic Society of Australasia for the work that we're doing in Māori specific education initiatives, which includes teaching at the university, including teaching some of the content that we'll show you today, as well as a number of other um, initiatives, um, including uh, an education in Māori learning environments. So I'm going to hand over to Stephen now to um, say a few more words about himself. Kia ora, Stephen. Kia ora, Phil. Thank you. And um, um, good morning, everybody. Um, I think Tiff has sort of said all about my bio. Suffice to say that I've had um, two decades also of work um, uh, closely with Māori um, here in New Zealand, um, both while I was overseas, but also interfacing with them increasingly closely. Um, now that I've um, been back here for, for two decades. And there are certainly some specific genetic issues that we uh, uh, need addressing, and it's been a delight to collaborate with Māori over these years. But there's also some cultural issues which must background this type of activity as well, and that's chiefly what we want to address today. Go to the next slide, please, Phil. So what we're all about today is talking about our, our Te Aroa very own project, the need to actually represent um, the Māori genome and the variation embedded within it to be able to deliver equitably for genomic medicine for the Indigenous people of Te Aroa. And so this is the bare bones of what we're about in terms of what we're trying to achieve um, in, in, in cataloguing and building that catalogue to develop a database um, of um, the first phase being SNVs and, and, and multinucleotide variation at the sequence level. Uh, for Māori, that will number around about a thousand genomes, and we're budget limited by that. So it's a it's a modest collection in terms of variomes that sit across the world. But where we think our point of difference is is how we've actually taken an indigenous focus to growing this right from the beginning. We want to embed um, tools ar around this database, which will deliver immediate clinical benefit. So it's facing towards a diagnostic and research benefit that's defined by Māori, and uh, and their priorities from the from the outset. The whole endeavour is funded by the New Zealand government. Um, we have a, 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 a life sciences platform called Genomics Aotearoa, which is trying to deliver capability and build infrastructure in the genomics space um, for our nation. And this is one of those projects which has been, um, been, been, uh, been funded by that platform since 2018. Next slide, please, Phil. So it will become um, no surprise um, to this, um, this audience here that it's becoming uh, self-obvious that greater diversity is needed in our human genomic databases, that we have this hegemony that's evident um, from the beginning of that activity in, in Western nations and, and East Asian nations that um, mean that those databases are, are predominated by those, uh, those, those genomes and the ancestry um, and the variation that's um, derived from those ancestral origins. But we all know that actually the discovery of causative genes and the genetic or the genetic variation that is embedded in causative of rare disease um, is ancestry specific. And it's particularly obvious, as is indicated by these uh, couple of excerpts from the literature down there, is just as a sample, that GWAS hits and the understanding the, uh, the genetic architecture of complex disease is also highly dependent um, upon the ancestral derivation of the communities and the populations that are studied. And the predictive risk scores, which are perhaps the ultimate deliverable from these GWAS studies, um, uh, perform variably according to this fact. And so the imperative is clear. But there's, a, there's an issue, there's a problem. And that problem is on, on this slide here, that there's been some, um, some, some unfortunate experiences 
um, some negative experiences for Indigenous peoples across the world, and um, specifically with Māori uh, that we're focused on here. And that inhibits participation in uh, the, the, the global uh, genomics community, and it's led to caution, uh, a cautionary approach by Māori here in New Zealand in, um, Adopting and embracing genomics is something that can transform um, and profitably um, improve health outcomes for their people. And so we uh, we have a background of this unfortunate history, and, and some of those experiences are listed here in North America and in Africa. There's basically been behaviour by researchers um, that perhaps has been uh, well intentioned but unthinking in terms of the unconsented use of samples, the unconsented use of data, the failure to actually get inside the heads of what's of priority to indigenous communities and to have them being treated as, uh, as biomedical curiosities. And outside the, the biomedical realm, the human, National Geographic Human Genome Diversity Project is perhaps the most um, emblematic and famous example of this, where low indigenous involvement from the very beginning, and so the research was done on people, not with people, um, led to uh, um, a massive disengagement and ultimately I think um, the, uh, the, the project um, the, the, you know, spelt the end of, of, of that particular project. It's a shame to see that even some of the biggest precision medicine um, initiatives in the world today, the All of Us initiative out of the USA, still seems to be making that same mistake in terms of its failure to articulate benefits in collaboration with Indigenous peoples that they're working with and so it's still not a voice that's been heard. Similar experiences here in New Zealand, some very specific ones, a, a famous one uh, that's known across the genetics community here of the, uh, the so-called warrior dream controversy of the mid-noughties, where uh, um, a, uh, a very wayward sort of interpretation of um, a very, very small sample of um, uh, alleles led to um, uh, negative stereotyping of, of, of Māori um, and uh, led to a lot of damage, uh, reputational damage um, and distrust uh, by Māori. And there's um, a couple of other examples there of, of how uh, the, uh, the genetic underpinning, the, 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 the genetic uh, uh, initiatives that have been adopted by government and by researchers here have not taken uh, the perspectives of Māori um, into account at all. And so that run, runs counter to the founding document of, of the New Zealand nation, the, the Treaty of Waitangi, which says that what's treasured and what's precious for Māori people must be taken into account. Um, um, in, in the spirit of partnership when decisions are made in this nation. So one of the ways of doing that um, is to uh, reposition the, the, the ethical frameworks within which the, within which the research set, sets. Um, and one question that I think that needs to be answered by the international science community is um, when they seek to work with um, underrepresented peoples is whose ethical framework dominates? Um, Stephen's given a plenty of examples of where things have gone wrong, and one of the reasons they went wrong is because the mainstream or the science ethical, or the mainstream science ethical frameworks were the dominant ethical frameworks. Um, our approach is different, and our approach in this project is based upon 20 years of work um, undertaken by a range of people, including myself. Um, but not, not only myself, where we have sought to develop Maori. Uh, te ao Māori, the Māori world, um, essentially what we call tikanga frameworks, where um, tikanga is essentially Māori bioethics, if you, if you like, in, in this particular space. It's, it's underpinned by values. Um, those values um, inform practices and ways of looking at the world. Um, there are a number of guidelines being published, um, and here's a subset of them um, for working with Māori communities um, and research in a range of different spaces, including medical genomics. Um, there's other spaces um, around working with genetic modification of, 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 of agricultural plants and animals, et cetera, et cetera. This work, um, this body of work um, had, uh, was initiated in the mid 1990s uh, under the, the then Helen Clark led Labor government. Um, and it has resulted in a range of protocols being published. And so in our particular um, study, um, we are using these protocols to inform uh, the study design. Before we go there, I'll just give a little bit of background to, um, to, to, to um, Māori in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and perhaps um, one thing to say, or the first thing to say, is that it differs very strongly to what many of you in Australia would be familiar with. 
um, first of all, um, Maori uh, or the ancestors of Maori who are referred to as Eastern Polynesians, uh, by and large accepted as being uh, accepted by ethnographers and archaeologists as being the first humans to arrive and inhabit um, um, Aotearoa, or that's the land we now know is now called New Zealand, around 800 to 900 years ago. And they got there um, by voyaging through the, around, the, around the Pacific Ocean um, and these double-held um, canoes, or we refer to them as waka, um, just like this one behind me here. Um, and when they arrived, they arrived um, and they had their own culture. Um, and that culture is referred to by ethnographers as um, archaic Eastern Polynesian culture. And there was development, cultural development, um, aligned with um, agricultural innovations and uh, uh, such like. Um, how um, and how the, the, the those ancestors, sorry, how those um, descendants of those original um, um, inhabitants um, and integrate, and integrated with the land and the resources here in this in this in, in this in, in this land. Um, so, in essence, the language and the culture is descended from um, uh, Polynesia, um, and there's strong, there's still strong links, cultural links, and language links back there, um, back to places, particularly um, in in eastern Polynesia, but also western Polynesia, and even back into places like Vanuatu and, and, and others. Um, some significant events um, in 1769, um, Captain James Cook arrived in in, in New Zealand. Um, and um, following on from that, uh, there was a pulse of, um, of, of essentially colonization by British colonists, um, which led to conflict. That conflict was temporarily resolved by the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840, um, which opened up the door for more colonists to arrive um, on the basis that Māori were promised to retain their resources and language, culture, and et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, that did not happen. Um, and after the establishment of military superiority by the colonists in the late 1860s, Acts of Parliament were passed and practices were undertaken that led to systemic loss of, lang of lives through diseases and warfare, land, language, knowledge, culture, um, education systems, et cetera, et cetera. So, to, so if we fast forward to today, um, after seeing a decline in population due to um, disease and warfare, Māori populations are growing. There's about, uh, I, I would estimate there's about a million people at least of, uh, with Māori ancestry, um, including almost 850,000 today here in Aotearoa as well as, and this point is relevant for today's presentation, greater than 100,000 people of Māori descent living in Australia, most of whom ethnically still identify as Māori. Um, and like I say, we'll get back to the relevance of that um, in a minute. Um, we, we see the, uh, with the, with the um, issues, addressing the issues via Treaty of Waitangi settlement processes and other processes, we see a, a, a cultural renaissance, if you like, um, that includes a return of assets back to um, tribes, as well as, um, as as well as small amounts of money being passed back in, 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 in settlement of these historical grievances arising from the issues that I raised, raised before. We see a strong presence of Māori in the health sectors, as evidenced by our recent establishment of a Māori health authority in this country, which is very exciting for us. And, and for this project potentially, as well as a strong Māori uh, presence in um, primary sectors, so in agriculture, horticulture, forestry, et cetera. Um, just to make mention um, and to bring it back into relevant to this talk, um, uh, Māori health is generally poorer than non-Māori, um, and there's a range of heritable conditions. You can probably all read those um, to get for yourself. Um, but certainly we are overrepresented in a number of negative health statistics, including conditions that, are, that have a heritable component to them. So, um, and just to finally note, there are many um, ancestry specific disease associated variants that are not present um, in databases that don't include um, Eastern Polynesian or, Pol or people of Polynesian descent. Um, the, most well known, the most well known one perhaps recently is the CRIB-RF variant, 
which um, increases body mass index, but in, interestingly reduces um, type two diabetes risk. And that's now the subject of much research um, internationally, as well as in this country. Just to bring this talk back to, um, to, back to um, indigenous ethical frameworks, a number of years or two years ago, um, I co-authored a paper along with my colleague and friend, Maui Hudson um, and Alex Brown, Professor Alex Brown, indigenous Australian geneticist um, and clinician, as well as a number of other people talking about the principles required to um, enhance that com the comfort of indigenous peoples um, in genomics research. And the discomfort Stephen talked about, I talked about um, Maori ethical frameworks. This paper was perhaps more generic in the sense that it, it talked about principles that apply perhaps more appropriately across um, or, or more generically across, uh, 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 across a number of international boundaries. And first of all, building trust. Oh, and I've got my alignment a little bit out there with the, um, so it was about building trust, enhancing a, a, a accountability and improving equity. And we're going to use that lens to describe the content of this particular project. So I'll just hand it back to Stephen and he'll talk about how we're doing, um, how we're building trust um, in this particular project. So perhaps um, building trust um, sounds like sort of um, motherhood and apple pie, but really it has some sort of uh, very practical sort of um, uh, ramifications when beginning a project like our very own project. So designed primarily um, from the beginning with uh, Maori ethical frameworks was, a, was an absolute criterion which had to begin. And that meant um, a, a number of ramifications about how samples are treated, how they're collected, how people are recruited um, into the project, um, and, and how their, um, the, the data and the samples which are uh, maintained within the auspices of the project are handled and stored as a result. We deliberately partner with Maori health providers and, um, and, uh, and, and some of them with prior experience to sort of blood the project and bed the project in. And now, um, now that we're midway through the project, we're extending to um, naive um, Maori health providers who haven't had any exposure at all to genomics in the past. And so that, um, that, uh, that start and in, in engendering um, comfort with uh, communities which have experience and then moving to those which don't has been um, very successful. The concept um, that uh, this is, has to be about health benefits, that this is not just some kind of repository to sort of um, have people or researchers um, step into and use as their play, uh, playroom is, is, is something that's central to the project. The, uh, the idea that the Varium has got to be used for benefits and benefits in the health realm um, sits central to the project and is explicit in the consent. And so any sort of an anthropological sort of research forever is, is off the card, for instance. The governance of the project sits with Māori as well, the key principle being Māori governance over Māori data and genomic resources. So the narratives which actually evolve from use of this is included within that. And so ongoing collaboration and the maintenance of these relationships are key. It's just not a step in and step out process by any means. And, um, and, and leading from that, uh, the science which actually will be sort of launched from, um, from this, um, this repository um, needs to actually have active Māori involvement in it um, as a principle as well. So the, uh, the governance that sits over this project uh, is uh, with a, a very um, uh, ropu, a ropu means group, and its uh, leadership sits with um, a, a very experienced um, uh, a wahini, a Māori woman, Huti Watson, who sits um, uh, within her tribe, her iwi, Ngāti Poro, um, in the east coast of the, of the North Island. And she's had 15 years of collaboration uh, with genomic scientists uh, using tikanga or uh, Māori ethical frameworks to actually guide that research. And so the rest of the ropu is, is characterised by Māori, uh, is com comprised of Māori health experts and representatives of the communities that have been inducted into the programme and are recruiting members of their communities into the project themselves. And their roles are, are listed there, leading the conversation, um, external communication about what the, um, the, the project is all about. They, they head up and they monitor all of that. Interim governance of, the, governance of the resource is going to be their responsibility as well until it's complete and we know all of the communities which are involved at which stage we'll be able to be more definitive about the membership of an ongoing governance group which actually maintains that relationship I just spoke to about on the, uh, on the first slide. It's got to be all about benefits um, and, uh, and, uh, and health improvements to communities if we're going to actually be able to um, speak to communities about what we're achieving for them. And so you know, going back to those communities and speaking to what we've managed to achieve is, is central to the COPOP. 
distinct slide, Bill. An example of um, a sort of a, a tikanga based approach is actually to think about how we recruit across uh, Te Aroa, um to actually get maximal representation of the richness that Māori, Māori um, speaks to and understands in its oral history, what's called, what's called whakapapa. That you can actually trace your lineage back as a, a person with Māori ancestry today, right back to the canoe, the waka that Phil talked about before, where it actually landed on the shores of this country 800 years ago. So on the left, we have a, a documentation of uh, um, most of the major waka landing sites um, from that uh, major migration from Eastern Polynesia to Asia 800 years ago. And you'll see most of them are in the north, um, with very few in the south. And so if we took a geographical sort of approach to actually recruitment in this project, it would be distorting that reality, the reality of how Māori um, ensconce themselves here in this nation. And that's reflected on the uh, modern day iwi, iwi being tribes. The modern day tribes are across Aotearoa, which are about 100. And you can see the vast majority are in the north. So when we recruit these individuals, we don't ask them about where they live today. We ask about their, their whakapapa relationships, what they, where their tapuna come from, tapuna being the Māori word for ancestor. So we ask them what waka they identify with, and we recruit via that sort of lens, a te o Māori lens, which speaks to um, uh, the, uh, the, the diversity that sits within Māori rather than any modern day uh, westernised lens, which might bring another approach to a recruitment for a project like this. Next slide. So just to pick up on Stephen's point there, such um, ancestral information is considered tapu. So that means restricted, um, sacred. And so because of the sacred, we have to set, we have to establish protocols around how do we protect that information. The benefit of having that information, if I can just put my statistical lens on, is that we can target specific areas where, rep where, where representation is lower. Um, as a statistician, was a statistical geneticist, if we did not have that information and we just randomly recruited, we would need two to three times the sample size and therefore it would cost us two to three times the amount of money that we would um, that would be required compared with taking the approach where we utilize this type of information. So of course, there has huge benefits for study design, um, but we have to be very careful about how we protect that information. And so that information is not made publicly available. Um, other ways of, 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 of enhancing our accountability, um, because Stephen has already mentioned some of those things, we have formal contracts with these partner organisations. Our Māori partners, our Māori health providers, our partners, um, um, you know, they're contracted to undertake the recruitment. Um, and so there's accountability lines between them and their communities and between the, 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 between the partners themselves and ourselves. So we have to have good relationships and we have to do things in an in, in appropriate way according to our tikanga, our cultural protocols. So um, one way of that, of that being the case is that the data do not belong to the project. They do not belong to the funder. They do not belong to the university. Um, they belong to the, the participants themselves. And in return for that, um, we uh, are able to return information back to the, the participant themselves. Um, there is no secondary use of data in this project. So um, the participants can assign their individual data to uh, so some other entity, such as their tribe, um, should they wish to do so. Um, and the very own itself, the data, the summary um, level database um, is permanently anonymized. So it's just an aggregated summary of population level data. And many of you will know what that, what that consists of kind of similar to NOMAD in the sense that the underpinning data, the individualized data, are not available and not included in the, in the summary level resource. Um, and the permission use of that resource um, is, a, is the, of the summary level resource. So we're developing the protocols around that, um, including um, implementation of a tool developed by the Silent Genomes Project um, in Canada. Um, and I sit on the international advisory panel for that. Um, where they have developed a resource um, which is overseen by uh, Indigenous um, uh, or Native Canadians um, and there's a permissioning process and protection process um, to enable um, appropriate use so clinicians can access that, that database under specific, under specific conditions. As, as can researchers, but again, there are specific conditions uh, uh, established and the permissioning of that 
um, is implemented in, in, in the data tool itself. So um, some of the benefits cases. Um, so we, many of you will know why, why, what a Varium is and why it's useful. Um, and looking at this information here, and I won't go through it in any detail, what we see is, 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 is essentially a, med a Western medical science articulation of what those benefits are. And of course, as I said before, Māori are afflicted by a range of conditions, monogenic, polygenic, there's rare disease present, um, there are pharmacogenetic um, uh, vulnerabilities in, in our people as well. So there's a whole range of outcomes, which um, from a clinical genetics perspective would probably seem obvious. Um, but in this particular project, we also have to rearticulate the benefits within, uh, within a Tao Māori, with a Tao Māori lens. Um, so there's a range of holistic Māori health models that um, have been implemented, probably the most well-known um, is the Whare Tapa Whā model developed by Sir Mason Jury um, a number of years ago and has been adopted by government entities as well as Māori health providers. Um, that particular model has essentially um, four components to it, four pole, if we like, um, the spiritual, mental and emo emotional components, the physical and a whenua-based component or a whānau-based component. So we rearticulated this particular project within those components and then ground truth that, um, with our leadership worker before we talk, before we started doing a, a single point of a single recruitment. So before we un, undertook the study, we need to make sure that this particular um, project had, um, from a Māori lens, had value to it, that there were clear, clear, and, clear and key benefits um, within you know, looking at the project using a Te Ao Māori lens. And I won't go through all of these components. You can read them for yourself. And I understand this um, talk will be available on YouTube so people can take a look at it at greater length um, in, your, in your own time. So I'll just hand back to Stephen who will talk about um, initiatives um, for how this project is, 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 is attempts to enable improvements in equity. So um, equity obviously sent, um, so it's central to the aspirations of the whole project, both in terms of uh, delivering medicine, but obviously delivering an appropriate cultural context, which brings comfort and confidence um, to Māori. And so central to that is the use of um, sort of uh, traditional knowledge, maparonga Māori, um, to improve the design and the quality of it. And I've given you an example in terms of how we recruit, but there's also examples in how we handle samples and certainly about how we're going to be handling um, um, data. The translation of um, the, the, the and the use of this database is also going to have similar sort of underpinnings in, in this manner as well, uh, with use of, of this database by Māori health providers as well as its governance um, being Māori as well. So we're we've sort of got a, a lens where we're actually training Māori to actually deliver the dividend as well as being involved in actually the creation of this resource. Next slide, Bill. So the progress so far is that we've established um, much of this tikanga, this, this ethical framework, and been able to, to, to um, sort of uh, uh, launch forth with some confidence and there's rising enthusiasm amongst Māori for it. We began with a very experienced organisation uh, in terms of actually uh, collaboration with genetic research uh, for some 15 years now, uh, Ngāti Parau on the west, upper west coast of the uh, upper east coast of the North, North Island. But we've now expanded to eight organisations which are now engaged with um, five of them actively recruiting with um, 350 individuals um, currently recruited and approximately 210 fully sequenced and variant calls at the present time. We've got an exploratory limb where we're doing some long read genomes, uh, first doing pack biosequencing, but going to extend to um, Oxford nanopore sequencing as well as an exploratory component to this. But the primary, com primary aspect of short read sequencing delivering us plenty of um, data across um, as numerous um, uh, cohorts as possible to deliver um, allele frequency uh, for, for rarities that sit within Māori genome to is core. And so that's um, where the, uh, most of the expertise, um, most of the effort has been, been focused. And there's capability development, which I talked about before as well. So extending into Australia is, is something we'd love to talk about and dialogue about today. As Phil said, many Māori living in Australia often out of economic necessity, but just because they're using the Australian health system and are relatively silent uh, about its adequacy does not necessarily mean they're comfortable. And the same goes for the use of the New Zealand health system too. That there's lots of evidence to suggest that the use of the, that the, the health system here is, uh, is not um, 
a full and comfortable fit for Māori and that's why health outcomes are poor in many areas. And the same can go for science and the science that underpins it as well. So we've tried our best to actually come up with a, a solution here which brings comfort to Māori so that genomic medicine will be a comfortable and natural fit for them. And we'd love to extend to you today the proposition that if, uh, you know, our, our awareness that you're moving and uh, very strongly in this area and you're a very multicultural nation to actually provision databases of a similar kind for underrepresented um, um, minority populations, that there will be many Māori in Australia who may step forward and you may be, uh, be, be um, dealing with Māori and Māori genomes and Māori data. And we would love to be able to extend a, a collaborative hand to you to say, would you like to adopt our tikanga? Because we fully believe that actually as Māori in Australia look back to Māori here in New Zealand and see that comfort has been obtained and, uh, and, and approval being given because we've taken this course, that actually a more positive outcome will result. I think in an Australasian context, we can actually deliver for Māori very strongly in this space, but I think it would be best done um, and, and, uh, using that collaborative model. I'd also like to extend um, uh, the, uh, the hand of collaboration out to diagnostic laboratories, I think, who will be seeing many, many Māori genomes or fragments of them coming across their desks uh, for analysis. And I think this resource is going to be central to actually delivering optimally for those patients as well. But actually um, understanding the tikanga and the, um, the, the restrictions and the, the culture that must underpin the use of this database is going to be central to actually its use. So I think we could start those conversations now. So just to acknowledge the people who have underpinned um, a lot of this effort, and obviously um, well, I haven't described um, a large fraction of it today, mostly sort of focusing on the, the cultural um, aspects of, of what we're trying to achieve. But I'd like to a big shout out to my team here in the laboratory of genomic medicine who are actually doing the, uh, the mahi with all the samples and, and the data. Our leadership group who is at Central to guide and appreciate uh, the, the process and, and keeping it on course. And then the individuals um, and, uh, and, and uh, organisations who have so heavily backed it from the beginning. And I'd like to actually shout out, especially to the Garvin Institute, who are our sequence providers, who have stepped very firmly and solidly into the space about getting into our heads in terms of actually the tapu nature of what we're about, the samples and the data, and have actually uh, drawn up protocols uh, to keep um, this, uh, this project safe. So let's begin our dialogue. Stephen, Phil, thank you so much. What a fascinating talk and, you know, particularly the, um, the sort of resounding uh, interest in collaboration and, and starting this dialogue. I think it's going to be critical to ensure uh, representation of, of genomic data sets, you know, in Australasia and we'd love to discuss further. Um, it's been... Um, your talks, you know, certainly generate a lot of interest. I've been receiving my text line is going running hot with people loving the uh, the content and particularly the um, the sort of ethical frameworks and the approaches to really ensuring that sort of the trust and accountability and equity is embedded in all all the practices that you're taking forward. Um, we've got a few questions on the line already, and I really would encourage others to not be shy and ask some questions. Um, so Miranda uh, is asking about um, developing genomic research projects. How should researchers in other countries that are planning to uh, manage samples of Maori participants within their cohorts proceed? Um, you know, are they, can you provide some advice on engagement within community and Maori ethics groups or sample repositories in Aotearoa? Phil, you want to take that one? Yeah, I think Stephen outlined um, a partial answer to that question already, which is um, where possible work with work with groups such as ourselves who have already addressed these issues um, mm. and undertake the pro and, and go through the, um, the the permissioning protocols that we've that we've already we've already established. Um, and, and and to my mind, that that seems like to, a, a reasonable framework. And one of the reasons for that. Um, from if I can put a Māori lens on this, is that um, we have a value of whanaungatanga, which is um, to look after our, our relatives um, and look after, look after our relations, even though sometimes we might have strong disagreements with them, 
we still there, we still need the uh, we still have a, a moral duty to look after their welfare. So in this particular project, um, again, you know, it's coming through those of us who have have opened up those doors, but mm. working within the frameworks that we have established. So I think collaboration with those who have who have who have established those pathways, um, and be willing to um, willing to. Um, be operating within a tikanga Māori framework. Um, there are restrictions around that. Um, some of those restrictions um, that are on things like publication and putting uh, putting information in the public domain, et cetera, et cetera. But those restrictions come from a Māori worldview perspective um, and are very well um, documented in, in literature and particularly in the Māori data or in Indigenous data sovereignty space. Mm. There's a great document, Tiff, um, on, on the web called Timata Era, which, which talks about research with Māori and the principles that should underpin it. When you read it, it's quite simple. It's not rocket science, but it takes extra effort. It's just another perspective you've got to get your head around. And um, I've seen it time and time again, that when you show that you've taken that effort, actually the, uh, the dividend that's given back to you from a community or from a participant is, is, is manifold over the effort that you put in. So um, that's where that's that's a good starting point, I think. Timata era. Mm. Yeah, I have actually seen that document. I've I've read that document with great interest. I think, you know, I you know the initial comments in your talk around um, the breaches of trust that have come before, you know, in the international internationally in the genomic space. Um, we've certainly got a lot of trust uh, we need to build back and, you know, by following these courses and, and engaging respectfully and, and authentically um, will be really important if we're going to proceed. Um, Melanie Barlow's asked a question. Hello, Melanie. Um, with the very own, do you plan to start with SNVs and INDELs and then extend to um, CNVs in a tiered manner? How are you approaching the analysis? Yes. Look, look, absolutely. Um, you know, this is a tiered process. And so we're doing the simple things first. Of course, we are running a structural variant caller as we do our short read genomes as well. But I think our ability to be able to catalog it, just like Nomad has taken several years to get structural variants wrestled into shape, the, the reality is going to be the same for our very own. So we're going to start with SNVs because we know diagnosticians are churning out um, results at the present time, and many of them are VUSs and they need resolving. So we're going to start there. Mm -hmm. And then structural variant will follow very, very soon afterwards, as, as soon as we can and wrangle it into shape in a, in a form which actually I think um, is, uh, is robust. And, um, you know, it's taken no matter while, and so it will take mm -hmm. us a while too. And then finally, be long read. We'll mm -hmm. want to get into the long read space. We'll want to do that sort of long range haplotyping, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, mm -hmm. um, that's on the horizon. Yes, excellent. Um, all right, we have a question from David Thorburn, fantastic project. Um, from through his sort of monogenic lens, apart from the wonderful resource for helping to solve inherited diseases in the people of Māori ancestry, can you say a bit more about the breadth of application to Eastern Polynesian communities? For example, in terms of knowledge about which countries and islands Waka came from? Yeah, the, um, the, the oral histories are very well documented now. Um, and by and large, where I've seen any genetic data, they have, uh, or DNA sequence information, they have by and large validated those oral histories to a greater or lesser extent. Um, so um, from my point of view, um, to, to, we, we would see, um, we would largely see relevance of this, of this very own resource in other countries such as um, Tahiti, which is French territory, in uh, Hawaii, um, mm. and that's the uh, essentially those 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 cultural connections and language connections I talked about. Um, there will be a parallel in terms of the applicability of this resource. Um, so I see things like a, a, an Eastern Polynesian genome as being a reasonable reference genome for the for populations of Eastern Polynesian descent. Um, there are very similar um, cultural frameworks um, as um, that's reflected in that common cultural um, 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 do we use this whakapapa, um, which essentially is that ancestral background. Um, so um, from, from our perspective, um, there, there's, there, there's, there's a lot of value in what we're doing um, 
um, in, 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 in the, throughout Eastern Polynesia and even into Western Polynesia. We see variants that are um, present in both Western Polynesia and Eastern Polynesia, um, but then we do see some Eastern Polynesian and Western Polynesian specific variants in, in research that, um, that sits outside of this particular project. Mm. Excellent, Ooh. thank you. There's broad relevance. Mm. Um, there's an interesting question here from Bob Phelps. Um, have Māori or other First Nations communities developed any ethical and cultural views about heritable human genome editing and germline genetic modification being widely advocated and promoted globally? So one of my um, other research projects is to was to um, essentially um, canvas and categorise Māori perspectives on genome editing, um, including but not restricted to human genome editing. Um, and um, one there's a paper that came out of that broader research project that um, I'm not a co-author of, but um, that well, it, it involved uh, over a thousand participants, half of whom were, were, were Māori in terms of um, uh, obtaining their, their perspectives on genome edit, of genome editing across a right, wide range of, of um, applications and probably one of the most common, commonly accepted um, application was in, 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 in improving human health mm -hmm. um, for things like, uh, for example, for, and in contrast for things like um, um, aesthetic applications, um, not so much. Um, for improving environmental outcomes such as ridding the environment of unwanted pests tended to be high levels of acceptability, but there was not broad or, or anywhere near unanimous acceptability. And one of the issues is the lack of Indigenous control over the application space, um, the lack of Indigenous participation at the front end of the research articulation process, and of course, um, whose ethical frameworks dominate in these, mm -hmm. in, in these areas, not just human medical genetics, but in other spaces, uh, other research spaces as well, where the technology has potential application. Mm -hmm. So yes, they have. Um, and we're currently writing a paper, another paper that we hope um, will be, um, um, will able, be able to be published in an international journal. So, so yes, but to a limited extent. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you, Phil. Um, Anonymous has asked a question around return and result policy. Are you informing individual participants when pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants are identified? Yeah, so our approach here is to actually be maximise the size of our, our, our data set with a very limited and constrained budget. So mm -hmm. our ability to deliver precision medicine for participants is negligible, unfortunately. That yep. would require a budget that would scale um, very considerably beyond this. And so we speak very explicitly to that limitation, but we actually sort of make it clear that actually we're, we're, we're delivering a clinically validated genome for them into their hands for use when or if that, that opportunity becomes available. Hmm. So we do regret our ability to be able to sort of give that feedback um, or what Māori call utu, in other words, gifting back um, to participants, but they get that it's a pay forward as well, that it's actually the generations to come which are going to benefit from your gift. So, regrettably mm. not. Yes, no, understood, understood. And in fact, that sort of the, the scale of the project leads into Michelle's question. And, you know, from the statistical genetics perspective, Phil, you know, the, the thousand uh, individuals uh, and enrichment of the, the variation, you know, the variome um, is challenging with that number. But, you know, as Michelle uh, asks, you know, this is, this is going to be built upon with other research, you know, come funding in future. Yeah, I expect it will be. Um, you know, we don't we don't expect that this this initiative will end when the current cycle of funding for genomics Aotearoa ends. Um, so, and we certainly invite um, re other researchers, whether they're in New Zealand or or, or or Australia, for that matter, working with Maori communities to consider contributing their data to this resource. Um, under the you know, of course, there's under under the mantle of Maori oversight and governance. Um, so that we can continually improve the resource um, mm. as much as we can. So I, I see it as being a dynamic pro project. Mm. Um, 
and as and ultimately because genome sequencing will one day become a, a routine diagnostic tool mm -hmm. um, whenever that can whenever whatever whenever that day arrives um, then I, I see um, you know large amounts of data coming through um, but of course to avoid the issues that have arisen in the past and the misuse and abuse of the data as well as inappropriate of narratives arising then we of course need um, the Māori entities to have governance over that to ensure the confidence of our people mm. to participate in such an initiative. So, mm. um, I might, I'm sort of conscious of the time as well. I mean, we've touched on, you know, beyond the, the wonderful work you're doing in Aotearoa, and you mentioned Alex's, Alex Brown's work uh, in Australia with the National Indigenous Genomics Network. Um, and the Silent Genomes Project, which you're, you know, on which you're the International Advisory Board, there's all these this rich international growing network of Indigenous genomics initiatives. Um, and I'd be interested in your perspectives as to sort of as an international genomic community, how can we cultivate and support uh, and deepen these Indigenous genomics initiatives and perhaps sort of connect them to ensure that you know, they can learn from each other's experiences and sort of develop uh, ethically sound, rich data sets um, that are in the, be the best interest of the First Nations peoples? Mm. I think that's a really good question. Um, and fundamental to that question is, is, a, is a question that I stated in the talk is whose ethical frameworks dominate? Mm. Um, so from my perspective, um, you know, there's been huge value in, in, in placing a Māori ethical framework at the centre of this research project and, and ensuring that informs the research project. There are implications for um, data availability. There are implications for the level of responsibility of those who wish to access very owns and such like in terms of what they can and cannot do. And some researchers see those restrictions as being um, restrictive and get in the way of their personal career development goals and an opportunity to publish in, in, in world leading journals and such like. So at the end of the day, it becomes, a, it becomes well, who, who dominates in this space and who's prepared to give what? Um, and the history of colonization and, and the um, distrust that's arisen as a result of that, um, but I can say in, in amongst our indigenous communities that our, our, our research collect, our collective comes from is that we're not gonna stand back. Mm -hmm. we're, not gonna, we're not gonna stand down. So at the end of the day, it's either, you know, either, either you participate with us according to the rules that our community set, it's not just us setting them, but it's our community setting them, we don't. Um, and if you don't, then don't even come and talk to us and go and work somewhere else. And um, I think Alex Brown gave a very good talk a couple of weeks ago at the Summer Internship of Indigenous Peoples Genomics Aotearoa, where he stated exactly that. If you're a good actor and you're willing to work well with us according to our definitions and put our ethical frameworks first and foremost, then come and talk to us. But if you're not, then don't. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think it's a great, uh, a great way to round off this talk. Stephen and Phil, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Um, and as Phil mentioned, um, this and other DNA Dialogue uh, seminars are available on the Australian Genomics YouTube channel. Phil has always, already um, threatened to send it to this uh, recording to people he doesn't like. Um, but it is a challenging time of the morning for many uh, who are wrangling kids and, you know, etc. let alone people on the West Coast. So please do uh, check out our YouTube channel for a recording of this and other DNA Dialogue seminars. Um, our next month will be joined by Rob Annan uh, of Genome Canada. And uh, so that's on uh, Thursday, August the 25th. So please do join us then. Stephen and Phil, thanks again. We look forward to collaborating with you and, you know, progressing these amazing initiatives. Thank you. Thank you thanks again. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye.